Good afternoon and welcome. I'm joining you live from the Australian Academy of Science in Canberra and I wish to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional owners of Canberra and surrounding areas. The Academy acknowledges and pays respects to the traditional owners and the elders past and present of all the lands on which we operate, live and work. They hold the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia. My name is Frances Saparovic and I'm a Fellow and the Foreign Secretary of the Australian Academy of Science. I'm thrilled to be here today for this special event to celebrate five of the Academy's Career Honorific Awardees. Career Honorific Awards recognise lifelong achievement and outstanding contribution to science in Australia and internationally. We are delighted to be able to celebrate these awardees from 2022 and 23, and we look forward to hearing them. So let's get started. To introduce our first awardee, we welcome former Academy Vice President and former Secretary for Biological Science, Professor Helene Marsh. Thanks. I'm delighted to be here today celebrating Academy Awardees. In particular, I join you today to celebrate the David Craig Medal for 2022. The David Craig Medal is a career award made in honour of the outstanding contributions to chemical research of the late Emeritus Professor David Craig. Its purpose is to recognise contributions of a high order to any branch of chemistry by active researchers. In 2022, this medal was awarded to Professor Christo Christopher Bala Kavolik. Before we hear Christopher, I'll read his official citation. Professor Christopher Bala Kavolik's work fuses the in-depth understanding of chemical processes that are induced by light with their use to prepare soft matter materials with applications from 3D printing inks to photodynamic materials. His main body of work, based on an esteemed career in physical organic chemistry, explores light as a molecular surgical tool, where its colour and intensity are finely adjustable gates to operate on the molecular structure of materials with unprecedented precision. This precision gives rise to materials whose mechanical strength and chemical composition can be readily adjusted without bringing them in contact with chemicals or heat. Christopher's work has enabled new material con co materials concepts, for example, a material that's solely stabilized by light, so-called light stabilized dynamic materials. Now let's hear from Christopher. Hello everybody. It's absolutely wonderful to be here today and give a brief lecture about the research that led to me receiving the David Craig Medal for 2022. What I will do today in the next 10 minutes or so, talk a little bit about precision photochemistry and what that means in the context of macromolecular chemistry. I'll present work that me and my team have done over the last decade or so. Light plays a key role in all, all of our lives. Indeed, without light, there would be no life on Earth. Light is essential for the all-important process of photosynthesis, which generates growth in our environment, which in turn is food, for all living things on Earth. However, light is also important in a multitude of other processes, um, from chemiluminescence to, chem to fluorescence, to all processes where chemical reactions are triggered by photons. And photons, as you might know, are often called a traceless reagent and are a fascinating medium to affect powerful chemical reactions. But let's go back a little bit in history 
to a colleague, a chemist, who in 1912 had a fantastic vision. vision. His name is Giacomo Ciamiccia, and he was an Italian chemist. And at that time, he made the following prediction. On the arid lands, forests of glass tubes will extend over the plains and glass buildings was, will rise everywhere. Inside of these will take place the photochemical processes that hitherto have been the guarded secret of plants, but that will have been mastered by human industry. And if in a distant future, the supply of coal becomes exhausted, civilization will not be checked for civilization will continue as long as the sun shines. Isn't that amazing? In 1912, Giacomo had the foresight to foresee what will be coming in the next 100 years or so, and the foresight of predicting of how important photochemical processes will be for the continued striving of and, uh, and success of um, humanity. So, for a broader audience, what is light? Well, light's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And light, as we call it, is just a small part of that electromagnetic spectrum. And we all know that that part of the visible light spectrum that the human eye can pick up constitutes is constituted of many, many colors. As exemplified here by this prism, and the colors of the rainbow going from low energy light to higher energy light at the blue end and the low energy light is at the red end. So if we look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum at the very high energy end, we have, for example, X-rays where the wavelength of the light is really, really short or the energy of the photons is higher then somewhere in the middle of this graph, we have the visible spectrum between approximately 400 and 800 nanometers. And then to the long wavelength, we have, for example, radio waves. Um, these are the waves um, that allow us to transmit, for example, a radio program. Now, I will focus in the next bit of the presentation more or less on the visible spectrum um, of the electromagnetic spectrum, the spectrum that we call light. And my research group has been fascinated with the power of light for a very, very long time because you can use light or the photons akin to a molecular scalpel. If you use monochromatic light, that is light of one single wavelength, you can do fantastic chemistry. And here's a graph that has been put together by talented PhD student Ishrath Irshadin and physicist, a postdoctoral fellow in my team, Dr. Sarah Walden, um, to illustrate some of the powers of light um, in chemistry. In my group, we classify chemical reactions in three different classifications in a sort of taxonomy of how photons can initiate chemical reactions. The first class in that taxonomy is what we call synergistic. So in a synergistic photochemical reactions, two photons of different wavelengths have to come together to affect a photochemical process. And that's illustrated here by these two beams of light of different colors, so different wavelengths intersect into a volume element. And only when they come together will a chemical reaction take place. There is also another case, which we call orthogonal. So in an orthogonal case, what happens is you have got the same colors of light, but these colors of light trigger independent processes in the volume element that you're looking at. So one color of light drives one reaction, where another color of light drives a different reaction, and both processes are fully independent. That is highly attractive for several applications, and I'll mention these later. We have got another interesting case, which we call antagonistic photochemistry. In antagonistic photochemistry, two colors of light come together 
to make a photochemical reaction not proceed. That sounds a bit weird initially, and it is, because one color of light initiates the photochemical process, while the other color of light, when it meets the first color of light in the first in the volume element, stops the chemical reaction. And you might say, well, why not just switch off the first color of light and that will be the first the effect. That is true, but here it allows you to switch off the chemical reaction in a specified volume element. And that also is very important for applications in 3D printing, particularly in high resolution 3D printing on the nanometer scale. So what is the major discovery that led to the award of the David Craig Medal? And that is the realization by our team over the last decade or so that it is very, very difficult to predict photochemistry based on absorption spectra. So what is an absorption spectrum? An absorption spectrum is showing you how much light of a particular wavelength is absorbed by a set of molecules or single molecule. So in a way, the absorption spectrum determines the color that that molecular species will present when light is shone on it. The interesting thing, however, is that these absorption spectra are no predictor for chemical photochemical reactivity. And that is illustrated here. For example, look at this beautiful blue absorption spectrum here, which we have the chromophores absorbance plotted on the y-axis and the wavelength plotted um, on the x-axis. It is, for example, for this reaction here where double bond reacts in what we call a two plus two cycloaddition to give you this target molecule. And if you were looking at that UV vis spectrum as a chemist, in the past, you would have thought, oh, well, I'm going to irradiate that molecule at the maximum where it absorbs so that most light gets translated and is used up for the chemical reaction. However, that is not the ideal wavelengths, surprisingly, to conduct the reaction. We have developed a photochemical action plot methodology where we probe the wavelength dependence of a photochemical reaction step by step. So we interrogate that reaction and ask the question, how much product is formed at each wavelength with an identical number of photons being delivered at each wavelength? And that is plotted here, for example. So each data point that you can see here in blue represents a data point of how much or how effective the photochemical process actually is. And the surprising and paradigm shifting result is that the absorption wavelength that we would have might have thought gives us the best chemical reaction is actually not the wavelength that we have to use to get the most effective chemical process. And you can see there's quite a difference between the two. And over the years, we have collected painstakingly action plot data for a vast variety of chromophores. And we have in nearly all cases observed that redshift and leading us to the statement that absorption spectra do not predict photochemical reactivity. This observation has since been confirmed in a range of other laboratories also finding these redshifts. There are multiple reasons why this redshift may be observed. The most prominent, probably the one that the absorption spectra doesn't tell us anything about the excited state dynamics of a photochemically reactive chromophore. Most importantly, it doesn't tell us anything about access to so-called reactive triplet states. You can imagine that having that information of where photochemical reactivity actually occurs is very, very important for practical applications. For example, you've all been to the dentist and the dentist would have filled a cavity 
and cured a photochemically reactive compound in the cavity using a lamp, you want to make sure that that occurs at the most effective wavelength. In our group, we have employed this knowledge for 3D printing applications. And the 3D printing application that we use most is called 3D, 3D laser lithography, going back to the work of Maria Meyer Göppert. I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a second. You have a photoresist through which a high energy laser, laser focus is passed. We call that laser focus a voxel. It's a femtosecond laser. And I've printed here in this cartoon the logo of the Australian Research Council. Then the photoresist is removed and you're left with a freestanding structure. And this allows you to print freestanding structures of your choice. And you can imagine that knowing the exact wavelength where you need to print is very important, or the other way around, you want to know what components to use, what photochemically active molecules to use to get an ideal outcome in that printing. This technique prints rather small structures on the micrometer scale, and it is used a lot in biology and in cell biology. But back to Maria Maya Göppert for a second, she is only one of three women to win the Nobel Prize in physics, which is very sad. So we need to um, passionately ensure that female researchers are empowered in our research ecosystem. And Maria Maya Göppert, in her PhD thesis in the 1930s, predicted what we call two photon absorption. The fact that a molecule can not only absorb one photon, but can actually absorb two photons. And this realization, this theoretical prediction has made this printing technique possible in modern days with the use of lasers. I will conclude by showing you one example of a 3D printed structure pioneered in my laboratory. We like to do crazy things with photons and quite often, you know, Materials are produced by using light, but can the materials that we are produce, that we are producing also be unmade? And what could possibly be the mildest trigger to unmake a structure? Well, you could use other photons, or you could use heat, or you could use an acid. All these don't sound too good. So we decided to pioneer material which unmakes itself with the mildest triggers of all, darkness. And I won't show you the chemistry of that. You'll have to go to one of our recent publications in that field, for example, this 2019 JAX paper, but I'll show you the result. With 3D laser lithography, as you know, we can print various structures. For example, this test structure here. And in this example, this photoresist from which the pillars are printed is different to from which these cross sections here, these little bridges are printed. These little bridges are printed from a photoresist that will degrade and disappear in darkness. And here you can see what happens to the structure if you leave it in darkness for several days. The printed structure disappears into the surrounding solvent. And that means we can print structures on a temporary basis. That's very important for applications in cell biology, but also in constructing what we call flying features in 3D printed materials. Thank you very, very much for your attention. And thank you for staying with me on this little tiny journey into the importance of action plots and the mismatch between absorption spectra and photochemical reactivity. And finally, I would like to thank my fantastic research team here at the Queensland University of Technology and my overseas laboratory at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. Thank you very, very much. Now it is my pleasure to welcome live with us today, Professor Christopher Barna-Kavolik. 
Thank you for joining us today, Christopher, and congratulations on the David Craig Medal. I'd like to start off with a question about uh, what determines which molecules react photo or have photochemical reactions. Could you explain a little bit further, please? Thank you very much, uh, Francis, for um, having me today and for that question. So um, it's a very good question, which molecules actually change and undergo photochemical reactions with light. And it really depends on two things, their ability to take up the light in the first place, um, which is determined largely by their, their color, which we as chemists um, try to assess via an absorption spectrum. And the, the next and perhaps even more critical question is, what do they do with that energy once they've absorbed that light? And some molecules will um, undergo some internal processes um, once they've been excited and then deposit the excess energy um, back into the environment via fluorescence. Um, we've all heard of that, or perhaps via phosphorescence, which is um, a delayed emission of light. And some molecules um, will actually go into, for example, what we call a triplet state. And from that state, then be able to undergo a reaction with another molecule or undergo a bond cleavage. So it really depends on how well do they absorb light and what do they then internally do with that energy and how they distribute that. Thank you. And uh, Now you mentioned that some of these molecules can make themselves in the dark and this could have uses in cell biology. Could you talk about that a bit more and also what other uses these materials could have? Yeah, thank you. So these molecules um, that unmake themselves um, in the dark, you have to imagine them that the photons that you provide to them are like a like a fuel that keeps them together. And you have to continuously provide that photonic fuel to make the molecules stable and, and stabilize them. And that's exploited um, in 3D printing, where we print with light to make a structure that is only stable as long ambient light or light from an LED or another light source um, hits the material. In um, cell biology, for example, um, you often have the problem, and I'm no cell biologist, um, this is just what my collaborators request of me. Um, in cell biology, you often have the problem that um, after you've cultivated a set of cells, um, you would like to remove the scaffold um, underneath the scale cells without um, damaging them. And that's actually a tall order um, to do if you uh, want to do somehow degrade the scaffold or take it away. And we thought one of the easiest ways perhaps to do that is if we degrade the scaffold in inverted commas with darkness, because darkness surely will not harm the cells. So you have the cells on the scaffold and you radiate with a very mild light energy such as 500, 550, 600 nanometers that doesn't damage the cells. And then in darkness, the scaffold uh, liquefies and um, basically flows away. Other applications are in 3D printing. Um, there are some 3D printed structures that you can only construct by putting helper structures up, scaffolds that you later remove. A little bit like if you're building a house and you're putting a scaffold and you later remove the scaffold. So um, using these light stabilized dynamic materials as helper scaffolds in 3D printing certain a complex object is also um, a current application field of these. It could co probably be used therapeutically as well. You could make reactions take place and create new medicines in cell. Yes, you you potentially you could potentially do that. <clears throat> What's always quite important to look at what are the how how cytotoxic are the chemicals that you're using to make these materials, and um, what are the byproducts that are formed. That is very true. Um, you. There's potential there, um, but we haven't explored that yet, and I'm not aware that anybody else has just yet. Thank you. I'm going to ask about the uh, reactions that you did with two colors of light, and that reminds me of NMR, where we do double quantum experiments and triple quantum. Yeah. So I was going to ask, what happens if you use a third wavelength of light? Does that act synergistically as well? Well, it would be fantastic if you could lock a photochemical system with three colors of light, Right now, we need two colors of light to make the reaction go. If you mix a third color of light, um, that would be really interesting. Um, but so far, we weren't able, and I don't think anybody else has been able to, uh, find a system that requires three colors of light um, to form a chemical bond. Um, 
you'd probably have to have a reaction where three reaction partners come together, something like a multi-component reaction. And these um, each reaction partner is somehow activated um, by the a different color of, of photon. And then they do this fascinating concept, but I unfortunately don't have any example of it. And it would be very difficult to, to, to devise such a system, I, I would believe. Thank you. So my next question kind of relates to the first one. So do all chemical or can all chemical reactions be controlled by light or is it only some? And if so, why? Yeah, it's, it's a very, very good question. And it's indeed only some can be controlled by light because um, it depends a little bit how you define light though. If we say, let's say light is visible light, then of course for a chemical reaction to occur, um, there has to be some sort of absorption event taking place um, of, the, of the photons that you would, would like to use. And of course, um, in the visible light range, for example, that's not possible with all, um, with all chemicals. Um, in addition, not all chemical reactions lend themselves to be triggered um, with photons. So it's a subset um, of chemistry that is, that is available um, for photochemical reactions, albeit a very important one, as we know from the um, very important example in nature of photosynthesis. And does each molecule have its own particular wavelength or, uh, uh, you know, like having different wavelengths for different molecules, or do they sort of occur in a similar wavelength range? Oh, they're all very individual. Um, and if you look at um, a molecule and find out at which wavelength it reacts most, um, that most efficient reaction wavelength will almost certainly uh, be different for each individual molecule. And the important thing to realize here, we can't predict that wavelength simply by looking at the absorption spectrum or in simpler terms at the color of the molecule. This is why you need these action plots to come in and actually map the photochemical reactivity. Yes, you did. You spoke about the um, photochemical action plot method and you spoke how you pray probe the wavelength dependence. So could you talk about that a little bit more as well? Yeah, it's a fascinating technique and it's been it's been around as a concept for a long time. Um, but we've really taken this technique and applied it to um, photochemical reactions that form uh, covalent bonds or that break covalent um, bonds. So it's very simple, actually. Um, as long as you have a tunable laser system, meaning a laser system that allows you to, to emit monochromatic light of different wavelengths that you pre-select, you then probe um, the um, reaction system by depositing a identical number of photons at each wavelength, and you record the response. For example, the conversion, how much product has been formed, and you plot that versus the wavelength, and you get this action plot, which then you can compare to the UV spectrum. And often, more often than not, these two don't coincide. And so as the reaction's taking place, does the reactivity change? Um, the reactivity changes with the wavelengths, but not at a single wavelength. Okay. That, that single wavelength um, has a defined reactivity for a specific molecule. We're starting to run out of time, so I'm going to ask you a general question. So what got you interested in chemistry? Well, it's an interesting um, little story because coming out of high school, I had two passions, history and, and chemistry. And I had a very, very good um, chemistry teacher in my um, junior year of high school in the United States. And she really um, um, showed me what chemistry could be and how fascinating it is and that chemistry really is the central science. Um, and without that um, teacher, her name was Ms. Schweizer, I probably wouldn't ended up as a chemist. Um, but at the same time, um, I remember that only two days before enrollment, I decided to do chemistry over history, but I'm still very interested in history as well. And you can go into the history of chemistry later in life. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much and congratulations once again, Christopher. Thank you very much, Francis, and thank you to the whole Academy for putting on this event. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, now to introduce our next awardee, we welcome back Professor Helene Marsh. Thank you. Thank you. I too am delighted to be here today celebrating Academy awardees. 
In particular, I join you today to celebrate the Jager Medal for 2023. The Jager Medal is a career award made in honor of the contribution of the late Professor John Conrad Jager to Australian Earth Science. The award is made to a scientist for investigations of a high order into the solid earth or its oceans carried out in Australia or having some connection with Australian earth science. In 2023, this medal was awarded to Professor Matthew England. Before we hear Matthew, I'll read his official citation. Professor Matthew England is recognized as one of the world's foremost experts on the ocean's role in climate, spanning time scales from seasons to millennia. His field of research spans physical oceanography and climate dynamics, where he's written seminal papers on global water mass formation, ocean, atmosphere, ice interactions, modes of climate variability and ocean overturning processes. His work has afforded profound insights into the circulation of the Pacific, Indian and Southern Oceans and their role in global and regional climates. He has quantified the Southern Ocean overturning circulation and its impact on climate in both present and past climates. He identified the critical importance of the Southern annular mode in driving trends and variability in the coupled ocean ice atmosphere system. And he shed new light on telecommunications between the tropics and Antarctica. Now let's hear from Matthew. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I really appreciate the honor of the Academy for this uh, medal. It's a tremendous privilege to join you and talk about some of the work I've been doing over the last few years and also over the last couple of decades. Um, before I uh, get into that research, I wanted just to acknowledge John Jager. I, I read his bio on the Academy website. I was really pleased to see a whole lot of things we had in common, but one thing that struck me um, that was uh, straight away was that we both started at, with mathematics at the University of Sydney and um, uh, Jager went off to look at geosciences and geophysics. And I, I, for me, I've been lucky enough to apply that mathematics to a field of, um, of earth sciences, ocean atmosphere dynamics. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So a great privilege to be here. And before I start, I also want to acknowledge this tremendous team of researchers, um, that I've had the privilege of working with over the last three decades. Um, these are a bunch of photos of the early career researchers. I've probably missed five or 10 um that have joined my lab um the fantastic scientists they've gone on to stellar careers in their own way and um the way they bring fresh uh fresh view of a science um it just reminds me how how good it is in in scientific research to have early career scientists come in with fresh ideas no preconceived um you know view about how the system works and it's been a great privilege to work with with these um scientists over the years um, just to give you some background as to my field of research, it is the physics of the ocean and the atmosphere and the cryosphere and the dynamics of the coupled climate system. Um, it's a very mathematical and physics-based area of research. We rely on observations and models and theory. And the goal of this field is to understand how our climate system works. And of course, today, um, how these big perturbation and greenhouse gases are changing the climate system. Uh, like I said, it's mathematical, and what I mean by that is there are actually equations that govern all of the motion in the ocean and the atmospheres. Um, there's also equations that govern the, you know, how density relates to temperature and salinity and pressure, and those equations are nonlinear, and so we have a complex system that has the capacity to sort of change a lot with a small perturbation. Um, there's also ways that the, the system can be self-limiting, so it's a very complex system to understand, and it needs, you know, bright minds who who are who 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 under who can do the mathematics and understand the physics and have that intuition about fluid dynamics to to sort of advance our understanding of the of the system especially at a time with these massive perturbations and and this diagram probably tells it all and what why is oceanography you know why is my field of research um being impacted so much by these surging greenhouse gases and this diagram shows you basically where the energy has gone to 
over the last three or four decades as greenhouse gases have trapped heat in the system. And it shows the lion's share is, is in the oceans and only, only a couple of percent can be found in the atmosphere, over the continents and in the co combination of all, all the ice on Earth. And at first you can think this is fantastic. This is a, like a free uh, way that the oceans slow down climate change. And that's partly true. The problem is that there's tremendous payback to that ocean warming. Sea levels are rising. Um, flooding rain events are on the rise. Drought cycles are intensifying. We're seeing dramatically um, dramatic events of bleaching. Corals are dying off. We're losing our coral reefs globally. We're at the start of this curve as well. Tropical cyclones become more intense because of that extra energy in the oceans. The polar ice caps are melting. I mean, it, it reads like a, a, a disaster list. And unfortunately, it's a, it's it's what it is. It's a big change to our climate system um, after 5,000 years of a relatively stable climate. So, um, and we're living it in 2023. It's not something we're going to wait to see in a couple of decades. It's already here with us. But in terms of the presentation today, I wanted to um, focus on a small piece of the ocean circulation problem um, that I've been looking at over, actually tracing right back to my PhD about 30 years ago, and that's the overturning circulation of the oceans. And this schematic here shows a bunch of arrows moving around the planet, talk, uh, around the oceans, showing the upper ocean water in orange and then the sort of mid-depth um, in the green and then the very bottommost water in blue. And what I want you to get out of this um, animation is this sense that um, at both the North Atlantic and around Antarctica, there are these water masses that sink to different depths and they move water right through the global oceans and that water eventually recirculates back to the surface. And these overturning circulations have been sort of stable and, and with us um, regulating our climate for, for millennia. And, and, but we do know from, from evidence that they're changing already today. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit about those changes and what we might expect into the future. This is now a view graph looking at a different perspective, sort of depth in the in the y-axis and latitude along the x-axis. And the overturning circulation in green there is the sort of upper cell, um, or it's the North Atlantic deep water, the AMOC. There's a lot of names for it. A big um, um, piece came out a couple of weeks ago saying this could collapse within just decades. And the, that, I'm not going to talk too much about that upper Atlantic overturning circulation. It's this blue overturning you see in the uh, in the upper diagram there with these uh, these flows reaching along the very bottommost layers of the ocean. And this is what we call the Antarctic overturning or the abyssal circulation. There's a few names going for it, but it's this circulation cell that we um, recently studied and where that, where that cell may end up as the decades unfold and as climate change um, progresses the melting of, of Antarctica's ice sheets. Um, you know, just for context, there's been a Hollywood blockbuster about the North Atlantic overturning. Uh, around Antarctica, we really have just only um, scratched the surface of observations. Uh, our models are not, uh, you know, most of the models we use for future projections don't have the right location for these water masses. So it was a, a really important, we thought it was a really important study to get out there because it, um, it, it it showed projections with a with the realistic model, as I'll show in a few minutes. Um, you know, why does this matter? Why do we care about this overturning circulation? It's a really important question. It regulates the energy balance on Earth, so it regulates how heat moves around the planet, and that even shifts our rainfall patterns in the tropics. That's dot point one there. There are potential ice shelf melt feedbacks, and that's to say if we change the circulation, there could be even further changes. There can be more heat on the shelf there that leads to more ice melt. So that's not what we want to see. That would be an amplifying feedback. And then finally, these overturning circulations bring nutrient-rich water from the very um, deepest depths of the ocean back up to the surface, that, that dot point three there. So this circulation matters, and we don't want to change its intensity. And the first sign of, of these changes came out already over a decade ago with this really famous paper by Sarah Perkey and Greg Johnson doc documenting just how much this lower lower panel in, in particular, that those red patches of water, these are the deepest layers of the ocean below 4,000 meters depth. And, and this warming signal, when this um, diagram came out, a lot of people thought this was heat from the surface getting into the ocean interior. Um, when I saw it, I first thought this is a sign of the slowdown. And I, you know, we didn't have the tool to just to differentiate between those two processes. We didn't really have the models at the time that could be used, but thanks to a, a wonderful consortium of scientists in Australia, um, we have a model, and also with collaborations back to um, GFDL NOAA in the United States, um, 
over at Princeton University, we have a model here that that captured these water masses and these red patches you can see on the right hand side diagram there. These are the precise locations that we see this dense shelf water formed in observations. And this model simulation um, captured those locations really accurately. I've, I've indicated them here in the red dots in the lower panel. And this is uh, an animation from the model showing um, surface velocities over the ocean. And these, these turbulent eddy features you can see in the circumpolar current north of Antarctica. Um, uh, really good to see those features observed. But what mattered for this study is actually the formation of the dense shelf water right around the Antarctic margin. I'm, I'm going to show an animation of that in a second. Um, just wanted to quickly um, mention, give a shout out to this consortium for ocean sea ice modeling in Australia. It's a community of about 100 ocean modelers. All the agencies involved uh, would stack up to about four or five more rows of, of, um, of credits down the bottom there. But this community has put together a model that really works well for Antarctica. And, and the best way to show that is this animation coming up. And just to give you an idea of the, the view graph here, this is looking onto the onto the um, Ross shelf. So imagine you're in a helicopter. Um, here's perhaps Ross, uh, sorry, um, Scott and his explorers heading off from McMurdo Station about 100 years ago towards the South Pole on the horizon there. And this animation is looking um, in at the shelf water. And, and what we've done is color coded all of the very densest shelf water with these purples and greens and where it's an accelerated flow, it's, it's these sort of green colors that you see in the animation. And so if you see, as we fly in towards the shelf there, it's these downslope flows here, these green patches that are cascading off the shelf that are really important to have in a model if you're gonna project the future of these water masses. And so um, with this ocean simulation, what we did is we ran it forward in time to the mid uh, 21st century, so to, to the year 2050, I'll just fast forward here. This ice animation shows that, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, progressively more and more ice melt has occurred right around Greenland and also particularly in the West Antarctic sector. And in this projection, we use not only this new high resolution model, but we also factored in the ice melt. And unfortunately, the projections we have to date didn't have the water masses in those four locations, nor did they include this very important contribution of the meltwater. And, and rather going, than going through that whole nature paper, I'm just going to quickly show you an animation of those bottommost waters that I previously showed from observations. That's on the left hand from the model going forward in time. On the right hand side is a measure of this overturning circulation um, going through to 2050. And you can see in this model simulation, it, it cuts down to about a 40% decline. And, and really this ice melt, unless we address emissions, really that ice melt forcing that triggers this decline. It's not going away this century. And I think there was a lot of interest in this paper because um, you know, we know the ice is melting, direct observations, and we know it's gonna continue melting and this overturning circulation is incredibly important for our climate system. Um, just one quick comment, you know, it, it was a global model. And so we did have a decline of the, of, the, of the North Atlantic overturning circulation. So this lower curve here is the same diagram I just showed for Antarctica, but for the North Atlantic, and you can see there that we only get about a 20% decline by 2050. When I say only, that's still a significant change to this water mass. But the reason I wanted to highlight this feature is that the Antarctic overturning is even outpacing that slowdown in our simulation, at least, um, compared to the North Atlantic. Um, and there's, there's a reason for this, I think. Um, and the best way to put it is that these four formation sites I spoke about are really at the front line of ice melt around Antarctica. The, the locations are shown here particularly in the Weddell and also the Ross Sea, and then just to the west of the Ross Sea in Adelie Land. Those blue patches you see here are where the salinity um, gets freshest in the simulation. And you can see those red dots are right where the freshening occurs. Fresh water is less dense, it doesn't sink, and that's why it remains there at the surface and why that overturning circulation slows down. It's still not great news in the North Atlantic. As Greenland melts, you can see that fresh water right around the continent. But the red patches that I've indicated there, those red dots there are where North Atlantic deep water is formed, both in the Labrador Sea and off in the Greenland, Norwegian Sea region. And they're just a little bit more remote from the ice melt. They're still vulnerable to that effect. But I think we've previously underestimated the chance for this overturning collapse around Antarctica um, when, you know, all the while, it really should have been very evident with these dense shelf water formation sites right there at the Antarctic margin. So to summarize that nature paper, at least, um, these new high resolution global ocean simulations will run out to 2050. They're, they're very different to the existing predictions we had because they get 
those water masses in the right location and the right sort of magnitude. We also added meltwater alongside warming and, and other changes like wind changes in those simulations. And what we get in those model um, simulations is this prediction of the of the bottommost warming of the ocean, freshening that is followed by increase in salinity. I didn't get to talk about that, reduced ventilation, and importantly, this marked overturning slowdown that looks headed for collapse. And I didn't actually show it, but we did delineate between the meltwater effects and other factors. And really it's meltwater that's a primary driver of these changes long-term. Again, no time to show this, but I can definitely address this in the question time. Observations that we have of oxygen warming down there suggest that our projections are already well underway. We're probably halfway already to that 40% um, slowdown. So look, um, thank you for the attention. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I'm gonna be here to answer questions uh, following the talk. It's my pleasure to welcome with us today, live, Professor Matthew England. So thank you Matt, for joining us, Matthew, and congratulations on the Jager Medal. Okay. So I'd like to start off with a question. Um, could you explain the science behind why the oceans are so good at trapping greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and really it comes down to their absorption capacity. Um, they're already absorbing heat at that sort of ninety-three percent level. Uh, it's it's incredible, you know, to to have all this energy trapped in our global climate system. Their absorption at ninety-three percent is is really set by their heat capacity. So it takes a lot of energy to warm up water. Also takes a lot of energy to you know the opposite sense to to cool it down. So um, they're incredibly good at absorbing heat. And then in, on the carbon side of things. Um, part of the reason is that where emissions are just going through the roof. And so the ocean's been sitting there for centuries used to a sort of pre-industrial, we call it, level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Suddenly humanity is just ramping it right up in, in this direction. And the oceans are playing catch up. They're doing their absolute best to, to, to equilibrate to that carbon level. Obviously they can't do all the work. We're only getting 25%, which when I say only, that's a lot. 25% of our emissions are going to the ocean and we're lucky enough that the land surface is doing its best as well, another 25% and only about half is left in the atmosphere. So it's a tremendous sort of ecosystem service. It's actually been cost at trillions of dollars. Um, but like I said, during, during my presentation, there's tremendous cost to that, you know, through bleaching coral, heat waves, um, damaging storms. We're seeing a cyclone developing, uh, a hurricane developing off the American coast today. I heard it's gone up to three already. I mean, these sorts of events are going to be all the ma all the more worse in the future. But let's just re remember, they're actually all, all the more worse today because of our increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, it reminds me of the wonderful heat capacity of water when I teach first year thermodynamics. So density uh, drives these currents or the bottom water currents. What drives the upper and the deep water currents? And are these currents also expected to slow? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question because a lot of a lot of that work that I presented today was about the what we call the buoyancy driven circulation to do with the, the salinity and temperature. Trevor McDougall is a guru in this area. Um, he spent his career looking at those properties and how they affect density of seawater and what the um, um, implications are. But for for in terms of your question, uh, one of the other big factors and, and the biggest factor that comes to mind when you ask that question is just the wind. So the oceans are driven by density effects, tides and winds, are, you know, and there are then forces that affect how they they th that flow plays out. But in terms of the upper ocean circulation, those wind patterns we have over the ocean, they do a whole lot. And actually not just for the, you know, the waves that we see and the upper ocean flow, also in terms of dragging some of this very dense water back to the surface. And um, it's pretty hard to find any bit of the atmosphere that, not, that is not changing at the moment. And in terms of the wind forcing, especially for the Southern Ocean, what's happening there is our is what we've caught. We used to call them the Roaring Forties. A lot of people are, call, are calling these winds the Furious Fifties, which kind of gives away what's happening. They used to sit at about forty degrees south. They're now getting close to the fifty degrees south, and so this wind shift that's playing out. It was projected. It is playing out. It's expected to keep going, although ozone recovery might help a little bit because ozone also controls those wind patterns. Um, those winds are changing, and that's going to actually rearrange not just the surface uh, water mass distribution, but also it's going to have an impact on these deeper water masses. Great. 
or perhaps not so great, but uh, thank you. So you touched on the movie The Day After Tomorrow, and I'm pretty sure that was overdramatic, but um, could the slowdown of the Atlantic circulation cause such dramatic climate effects? I, I love this film being there. It's sci-fi, and I think everybody, I hope everybody's listening, watching, realise sci-fi, the second bit of that is fiction. Um, but it's, the first bit's really important too, science. science. And so... Um, I love that film when it came out because it really drama dramatized actually scientific research as well. The desperation of the researchers to look at, you know, there was a problem coming along. So much of that film, I watched it almost 20 years ago. And I remember seeing labs that I recognized, seeing people I recognize, seeing desperate messages going out. So if anybody hasn't seen it, do go and look at it. But in terms of the science and the overturning circulation, it was entirely focused on the North Atlantic. To make it watchable, they shrunk thousands of year time scales down to a few days and then of course there was this magnificent ending where rather than um south of the u.s border um people fleeing to the u.s as they do today ho hoping for for a better situation um it was the inverse it was a beautiful ending where actually the americans had to leave their country and I, look it's a good film I, I could talk for hours about it but um obviously this can't play out in reality but but what it did is it dra dramatized um, the way our climate's changing, it made it a brilliantly watchable Hollywood blockbuster. Tons of errors, but hey, it, it, drew its it drew attention to these water masses that we're talking about, to the fact they can change suddenly. And even I saw a couple of weeks ago, that overturning circulation in the North Atlantic, a big paper came out. It overwhelmed all the media I saw, all the coverage of science for a couple of days was totally focused on this paper um, that came out in Nature Communications. Similar process to our study different approaches but they're talking about a collapse a, lo a lot of the coverage was a bit unfortunately focused on a, a collapse within the next few years it was really about the most likely time for a collapse of that overturning according to their study was about 2060 it could be as late as 2100 uh, all the signs are it's not about to happen unfortunately and so unfortunately some of the media coverage was not quite good but um yeah great film great scientific coverage but yeah a, a few things that weren't quite right I enjoyed it as well. So you spoke about two models, one that doesn't include the water masses and the, the, your nature paper that you mentioned. So could you um, explain to us, not mathematicians in the audience, how you create these models? Yeah, that's no, another great question. Okay. I, I spoke a bit about the um, communities behind the Australian model. We use 100 people, you know, a core of 20 that really draw and really a core of five. That, yeah, there's different tiers of engagement, of course, but globally we have such groups around these climate models. And these are the climate models that go through to IPCC projections that make it to the, well, I hope they make it to the front news because it's they're really important. And we're seeing projections from the first IPCC report and second IPCC report 30 years ago playing out as predicted. So they're important to look at, but the, the question you had about is how these models are built and the communities that get around them. What was different about our study is that we put all the resolution and all our efforts in some sense into getting these water masses around Antarctica. It's a global model. It's trying to do the everything well across the globe. But a lot of climate modeling groups globally um, might have their focus on the North Atlantic or on the European climate. And so Really, the best way to describe this is that um, what's different about our model is that the focus was on the Antarctic margin and those four water masses. Unfortunately, up until our study, all of the IPCC model projections uh, used models that had big biases in that region. We've written a couple of papers about that, showing where those biases are. It's not to can those models. Those models are fantastic globally, but for that corner of our planet, they had big biases. And what we were delighted about with this model when it came along, thanks to a lot of work from a big community here, is that it had those water masses in the right location, forming the water masses at about the right magnitude. And, and scientifically, it was that sort of breakthrough moment where we, where, we, where we were delighted to have a model that worked. And then we got to work about, you know, let's use it for these projections. That relates to one of the questions from a member of our audience. So they mentioned that there's been a lot of news about Antarctic ice and they would like to know how the currents play a role in this. Yeah, so so the, you, you mean the actual Antarctic sea ice changes at the moment? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. No, th this is confronting. I, I, one of my colleagues, Ed Doddridge, spoke about it being a five stand deviation. Of, and, we, and we thought this is crazy because that statistically that's one in you know a billion years or something. And, 
I've since seen nine standard deviations. So it really is an off the charts event. Um, you know, this is just playing out now and a lot of people around the world and in Australia are looking at this, Will Hobbs and at Doddridge in particular down at University of Tasmania. Um, at the moment, we know that there's been a big decline back in 2015, 16. That seems to have reset the sort of basic state of Antarctic sea ice. And if you look at the records, we had this, I'll, I'll turn the axis the right way around. We had this sort of growth in sea ice for a while um, that everybody was talking about what's going on. Suddenly a big decline in 2015, 16. Since then it stayed low. And then suddenly this year's come along and it's really low. Um, sea ice is not regrowing during winter. Um, so it's not, in a way, it's not a lack of sea ice. It's more that the the, the regrowth out of last summer just hasn't been happening. Um, and, and a center and part of ACES led by Matt King actually has got this on, on, our, on our radar. So the answer is work in progress. The ocean's almost certainly playing a big role. Um, global warming is part of this as well. So again, you know, we're resetting our climate and suddenly records are being broken. Um, it's to be expected. Uh, we didn't sort of ever expect climate change to progress gradually, steadily in time. Um, and that's part of the problem of communicating our science. You know, every year is not going to be a world record breaking year for every metric. It actually plays along with bumps and kinks as you go. And uh, uh, this is this is what we projected, unfortunately, 2023 uh is is showing us that we were sort of falsely comforted by this growth of sea ice around Antarctica for a couple of decades. Um, it, all evidence is that this this sea ice, um, well, it's now declined in 2015-16. It's sitting at a much lower level. And, you know, the projections have always been that this would decline and, and potentially we'd lose Antarctic sea ice altogether during summer and and really lose a lot during winter. So Things are on track for the, with the projections. The answer to the question is hard because we've just seen these observations for the first time. But um, definitely ocean ocean warmth is is virtually certainly the culprit. Yes, it'd be sad to see the sea ice go. But uh, I'm going to uh, go back to your model. You mentioned, what, what was it, dense shelf water? Why is that important to your model and what actually is it? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And we use all these uh, jargon terms in science and I sort of say it without remembering dense shelf water is just basically the the densest variety of water around antarctica it's formed during winter it's formed by sea ice formation so that's why we want sea ice to be growing each year um because it's in, indicative of that formation process um and that dense shelf water is very saline very cold it sinks to the world's bottommost layers of the ocean those red patches that i showed previously that's where it ends up but its origins are up on the shelf. And it's it's this time of the year, in the next couple of months, that Antarctic sea, oh, sorry, that Antarctic bottom water, this dense shelf water will be formed. Um, let's hope it's formed in, in vigorous amounts, but but all the signs are this year will be a lower year as well. Okay, we're running out of time, so I'm going to ask you to quickly let me know why did you decide to combine mathematics and oceans, or how did you get into this area? Uh, completely by accident. It's a good question. I, I loved maths and I love physics and I was enjoying student life at Sydney, but I also love surfing every single day. I've heard people say it was once a week, but it's actually every single day. Um, and I love being in the oceans. And actually, when I discovered a handbook at Sydney University, uh, I was flicking through trying to find a subject that combined, the, you know, the next step, where, where could I take my mathematics? And just by chance, I, I saw a, a tiny little story about a physical oceanography program, which I'd never heard about. Helpful, it helped. There was a little wave photo beside it. So a big phone book worth of courses to see the the, the photo of the wave there helped. Um, but yeah, by, by accident. And then, you know, over the years, very early on, lots of ocean exploration, lots of voyages to, to faraway parts of the world as a, as a 22 year old to be, to be asked to go to the middle of the Pacific Ocean for, for a month to go make measurements. I couldn't believe the discovery of the world's oceans that was waiting and at, at the age of 22 i had no idea I'd, I'd still be here age almost 60 um but it's been a really fun ride and i think you've been surfing the ocean rather than the web but thank you so much matthew and congratulations thanks francis now to introduce our next awardee i call upon uh, the vice president and secretary for physical sciences professor Mal malcolm sambridge Thank you. 
I'm delighted to be here today celebrating Academy Awardees. In particular, I join you today to celebrate the Hannon Medal for 2023. The Hannon Medal is a career award that recognises outstanding research in any of the fields of statistical science, pure mathematics, applied mathematics and computational mathematics. It honours the contribution to time series analysis of the late Professor E.J. Hannon, Professor of Statistics at the Research School of Social Sciences of the Australian National University. In 2023, this medal was awarded to Professor Richard Hartley. Before we hear Richard, I will read his official citation. Professor Richard Hartley has made important and pioneering contributions in the area of computer vision, both theoretical and applied, especially in mathematical underpinnings of the field. He is one of the founders of the research field of multi-view geometry, which is the technical foundation behind the computation of digital 3D models from sets of images or videos. This technology allows construction of models of cultural or archaeological sites, as well as city and anatomical models. It also facilitates the robot navigation in complex environments and production of real, tangible models of objects through scanning and 3D printing. The goal of his recent research is to provide a theoretical basis for ensuring that models are correct and accurate. In one of his notable contributions, he has identified the exact conditions under which available data is sufficient to allow unambiguous model creation. This work relies on advanced methods of algebraic and projective geometry. Now let's hear from Richard. So thank you very much. It's great to be here and I'm very honored to receive this award. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my work, uh, which is largely concerned with modeling from large numbers of images. So the, 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 the context is that you have a camera which is moving around a scene, taking pictures from all sorts of different angles. And the task is to, to, to determine the motion of the camera from these images and to build 3D models like these ones here, uh, triangulated models. So a little bit of history on this. Um, around the 1994 era when I started work on this, this was the sort of thing that you could do, taking pictures of uh, synthetic blocked houses and making these on the right-hand side so-called reconstructions, where at least you can see the uh, square corner of the of the building in, in the points that we've got there. This was possibly the first Euclidean reconstruction with uncalibrated cameras at that time, 1994. At about the same time, we were working on this uh, task of image stitching, uh, which uh, this is some pictures I took of the Capitol in Washington and stitched them together using some of the techniques which we developed. Uh, this is the sort of capability which every uh, smartphone has these days. So, mm -hmm. Moving forward a little, work from um, uh, Mark Polifes of the 1990, around the 1994, where he was taking pictures of uh, images of this castle or house and uh, making models like this, which you can view from different directions. So this is known as uh, image-based modeling, image-based computer graphics. Other images of that time, uh, once again, the cathedral in Leuven, where you can see in the bottom right uh, the reconstruction, the little triangles indicate the positions of the cameras where the pictures were taken, and the white bright dots, the, the corner of the building, which is reconstructed. Actually, it's a 3D. We're just looking at it from the top here. You And on the left is, is the, the cloud of points. Uh, more examples there of, of the results they're obtaining. And some examples moving ahead a little bit, 19, 2004 now, working with archaeological sites in, uh, in Turkey, visual modeling and preservation of these archaeological artifacts and heritage. So I'll talk a little bit about how this is done, which is uh, how you do this, the steps of the reconstruction or the steps of the modeling. First of all, you, you may have a video or separate images. You track the points in the video and find correspondences between the points in the different frames. This is followed by a step of projective reconstruction. 
self-calibration, which means uh, changing the reconstruction from purely projective geometry into a Euclidean geometric framework and model building. So here's an example of uh, uh, an image sequence here, taken uh, from a helicopter, I guess, in Los Angeles. The first step, as I say, is to track points in these images. And these are points which are tracked across the image. And then uh, you can construct a model. This is a very you know, simplistic model of the scene. The points are the points that you tracked, and that's their 3D positions now. And a, a 3D model is fitted to these, as you see. Uh, you can also overlay this on the original frame to see uh, how those points correspond to points in the image. Of course, when you've done this, you, you have a, an understanding now of the geometry of the whole scene. Uh, and so you know where the cameras are located, you know where the buildings are. You can do things where, for instance, you're overlaying artificial reality on the top of these uh, buildings and put a television screen on the side of the building and a logo on the, on the front of the other one. Uh, it also has been used in the area of film production, where and this is the sort of thing that you can do, a sequence of, of images from, from Oxford, and uh, the points which are viewed in, in the sequence in blue at the bottom. And now you're able to insert uh, artificial uh, ro or robots or avatars in the scene as seen like this. And one of the prerequisites for being able to do this is to understand where the cameras are and what the geometry of the scene is so that you can place the avatar on the ground and place it in the correct position with respect to the camera. These are all examples of artificial objects being placed in the scene from of a camera, taken by the camera. So what is the mathematics behind this? This is uh, mathematics which has developed over the last, say, 20 years, a little bit more, and described in detail in this book, which I wrote with Andrew Zissman in Oxford. So structure and motion is the topic which this book is, is about, uh, multi-view geometry. The origin of this, perhaps, is the landmark paper in 1982 from Christopher Longett Higgins, where he defines a thing called the essential or fundamental matrix and gives a way of reconstructing scenes and determining camera motion from just eight points as seen in two images. Uh, this is perhaps a rediscovery of things which are known by German photogrammetrists uh, earlier in the, in the century. But one of the major themes or key insights that are uh, developed in this topic of multi geometry, structure for motion, is the, no the idea of epipolar planes and coplanarity. So in this image, the rectangles represent image planes, the centers C are the centers of projection, and X is a point in the scene, which are viewed at points X prime in one image and X in the other image. And so the fundamental matrix gives you a relationship between the positions of X and X prime that allow you to check and find proper correspondences. So here's another example. Well, as the point X moves in space, the plane formed by the, three, the two camera centers and the point X intersect the two image planes in two lines, L and L prime, as seen in the top image. And those are a point on one line must correspond to a point on the other line. So for instance, in this image, all points on one line in one image will correspond to points along the other line in the other image. So the fundamental matrix gives you a way of determining what those lines are. Here are other examples of epipolar lines, which uh, their appearance depend substantially on the motion of the camera. This is all uh, described in 
or expressed in terms of the fundamental matrix, which a certain relationship, this relationship here, must be satisfied by, by two points x prime and x, which correspond in two images. So this can be expressed uh, in terms of this equation down the bottom, where it's uh, expanded out. And this is a linear relationship in the F, which allows you to solve for the fundamental matrix and hence understand the epipolar structure, the epipolar lines in the two images. Uh, this work was um, <clears throat> extended in some of my early work in this to a thing called the trifocal tensor, which gives you a relationship between three views of an object. Once again, three views uh, seeing a line. The lines in the image must have bear a relationship to each other, which is expressed by a thing called the trifocal tensor, as, as here. A step of pre projective reconstruction uh, gives you uh, those two images, will give you a reconstruction as in the bottom left. So it's a little bit skewed. There's a step of direct, direct metric reconstruction, which takes that into a, a properly proportioned model. Metric reconstruction. Um, so that's a fairly elementary area um, of, of this field of multi-view geometry. Some of the other work I've done relates to a thing called the Fermat point of a triangle, or in general, the center, the L1 center of a set of points goes back to a thing called the Fermat-Torricelli problem in the 17th century. And in the 20th century, a paper by Ernst Andrew Andre Weisfeld um, came up with an algorithm for solving for these problems in a more general context. We have uh, generalized that further to work out on how you can apply this algorithm two points on manifolds, uh, Riemannian manifolds. So um, you're able to, and proven that in fact, the Weisfeld algorithm will converge on manifolds of so-called non-negative curvature. Um, this we've applied to a problem in geometric reconstruction of this type. Uh, and this is a, a set of points from Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris which we've applied our algorithms to. 280,000 points, 42,000 pairs of overlapping images, 569 images involved in this reconstruction. So there are billions of photos now that online, photos like this, um, which um, led to some researchers um, at Cornell University and Microsoft uh, developing a system called photo tourism, which allows you to build models like this. For instance, this is the Trevi Fountain in Rome, using nothing more than images which have been downloaded from the web. Photo sharing websites such as Flickr have accumulated thousands of photos of the world's famous sites, like these of the Trevi Fountain. However, the usual flat image browsing tools don't give a good sense of how all the photos are related. Photo tourism lets you step into the photos and explore them in a much richer way. Our system takes a set of photos like these from the internet, automatically builds a model of the scene, and creates an immersive browsing experience. In this work, we'll take you around the world, from Rome to Paris, to the breathtaking vistas of Yosemite. Once again, the steps involved here are feature detection, where we find points in the images, find correspondences between those points, and then do so-called structure and motion where those correspondences allow us to determine the positions of the cameras and the, uh, and the, and the, the geometry of the scene itself. Doing incremental structure from motion. Here is a video which shows how this can be employed on a city-wide scale. This is the city of Dubrovnik, once again reconstructed entirely from images of tourist images taken from the web, and a so-called point cloud reconstruction of Dubrovnik, 
is is done. The the little the little pyramids there show the positions of the cameras that have taken the images. Finally, I should just mention that over the last decade or so, modern AI-based reconstruction methods have uh, been, become more and more important. And here is um, a result, more very recent results, the so-called NERFs, neural radiance fields, which allow you from a small number of pictures to reconstruct and take reconstruct and synthesize scenes taken from arbitrary directions, which were not directions that the original images were taken from. So that gives a, a brief introduction to the work I have done in this field and the way it has developed over the last 20 to 30 years. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome live with us today, Professor Richard Hartley. So thank you for joining us today, Richard, and congratulations on the Hannon Medal. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here. I'd like to start off with a question asking you about these 3D image reconstructions. So you work with uh, static objects. Can you also apply this to moving objects? Well, you can apply it to moving objects. It's significantly more difficult, but a lot of work has been done on that. Uh, you effectively have to separate out the individually um, moving objects from which one of the main tools you can use in doing that is this fundamental matrix, which I spoke about, and that allows you to segment the scene into differently moving uh, objects and then um, reconstruct each part separately. So. That's uh, also an interesting topic of, of research. I suppose you need a lot more computing power as well to do that. Uh, well, yes. I mean, so computing power has always been a, an issue uh, here. In fact, a lot of these, some of the city scale uh, things that I showed, uh, often the amount of computing power there runs into weeks of computing power, uh, at least in original implementations. And a lot of work has been done to make it a lot quicker. And there's a famous paper called Rome in a Day in which people have made a, a model, a reconstructing model, reconstructed model of Rome in a day of computing. So from images taken down on the web. So that has definitely been a, an issue, the amount of computing power. And uh, it's something which... Uh, a lot of improvements been made there. So it's actually now relatively efficient. A good way to not uh, not get jet lag. I thought I've just come back from a trip myself, but I still <laughs> like to see the things in real time and real space. But what I'd like to ask you about next is, could you explain a little bit further? Cause some of us aren't au fait with, um, what was it, a Euclidean reconstruction? Could you just tell us a little bit more about that, please? Okay. So, uh, it's better to explain what a non-Euclidean reconstruction is. And so a lot of the work was done in terms of computing what's known as a projective reconstruction. And what that means is using projective geometry and so-called uncalibrated cameras allows you to make a reconstruction of the scene, but one which is warped or by a a so-called projective transformation. So it does not correspond to the real shape of the, the objects. There's a geometric uh, uh, transformation, which one can then work out what that is and then rect so -called rectify it and transform that reconstruction into one which is metrically correct, looks the right shape. Uh, and that's a, that is a Euclidean reconstruction that one obtains then. Um, yeah, that's, that's the, the general idea behind it. You can go by an intermediate step, which is a so-called affine reconstruction, which it's correct up to an, a so-called affine uh, reconstruct, an affine transformation of space, but still doesn't really look correct. Uh, so okay. the, the you. Euclidean reconstruction is what you're ultimately aiming to get through a series of intermediate steps. Great. 
So uh, you started, uh, when you started out doing this in the late 90s, these 3D images, where did you see the field going? Uh, well, um, at, at that time, computer vision was always thought of as being a, a promising technology. Uh, and so, but it, it remained a promising technology for a long time. And uh, one didn't, uh, one hoped that we'd you know, be able to make rapid progress at some point, but progress was slow. I remember in the around 2003 or four time frame, one of my uh, colleagues sort of saying, talking about some of his results and saying, he'd never believed that he, you'd ever be able to do and get the results like uh, you can uh, then. Uh, now, 20 years later from that, the uh, with I showed you at the end, those NERF results with excellent, excellent reconstructions uh, and computer vision in general in the broader framework has uh, made tremendous, uh, tremendous strides in the last 10 years to a point that would, I think none of us at that point really thought that this would that this would happen. But we're, so we're all really very surprised uh, and, you know, find it enormously comforting that our work has led towards these uh, great results that you can get these days. Actually, Richard, when you said nerve results during your uh, talk, I thought you meant nerves. And I was thinking, oh, you could use this for medical reconstructions and also for teaching purposes in medicine, right? Well, yes, uh, NERF stands for neural radiant field, but uh, of course there's a lot of uh, work in um, computer vision and machine learning in the medical field, uh, particularly, and I've worked on it myself, in the area of uh, looking at and interpreting radiological images, MRI images or CT images. Uh, usually in those situations, the um, uh, the body is, is usually you know, somewhat non-rigid in a lot of parts. So a lot of the, these techniques of exact geometry don't really apply, but uh, um, that is one of the important fields that we, we do look at. And what about movies? Have you ever helped a movie place an object in the correct geographical location? Uh, well, I in the, in the correct geographical location, uh, I have um, worked a little bit in, in this is a, 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 a question of where one looks, has a, one learns from a, uh, a situation, of, has a lot of images, for instance, all the images of Rome, uh, there are many, many of them, and then one takes a single image and then says, where is this image taken, right? And uh, this work that I described um, applies directly to that problem that one uh, has to sort of find points in the image which sort of uh, match with points in the database of all the images that you've seen. And then from those, you can use these geometrical techniques to work out exactly where the, the image is taken. Yes, and I've, I've done, I've worked on that a little as well, uh, as have many, many people. But what got you really interested in this? What got you interested in uh, image modeling? Well, in a sense, it was it was all really perhaps by chance in a way that I was I was at working at General Electric uh, Research Laboratories in Schenectady, in New York, and I was working in a completely different field, which was design of electronic circuits. And we talked with uh, one of the divisions of GE, which was working on flight simulation, uh, and they were saying, "How can we?" Uh, do this and get do flight simulation better. How can we, for instance, make our flight simulation use real terrain, uh, properly shaped in from that we can extract that from aerial images? And this is the uh, the area of three D reconstruction of the ground from several images. So, um, although it wasn't anything that I worked on at the time, I thought, well, let's have a go at that. Uh, and I looked into that. I looked at some of the companies that were doing this and thinking, well, I think you could do it a bit better than, than the way they're doing. A little bit less input. You don't need uh, all this information. You can, and so that's how that's how I got into it. And then someone convinced me, in a, in a way, uh, and uh, to maybe switch fields 
into this area of image analysis rather than the electronic design that I've been doing in the first place. And we had a, uh, there was this work going on at General Electric from a person who was very much my mentor, Joe Mundy, who uh, decided that, uh, you know, I had something to contribute in this field and convinced me to get working in that field. And uh, so I did. And that was perhaps about a little over 30 years ago now. Uh, so. so thanks to Jack Mundy. Okay. Yeah, thanks to Jack Mundy, <laughs> indeed. And so just to finish, um, could you tell us what's your uh, favourite or what's, what problem you're most proud of having solved using this method? Well, I suppose I'm most proud of, of the book that I wrote with Andrew Zimmerman, uh, and um, it's because it's, it's become so well known in the field and everyone relies on, on that. And it, it was largely, well, not entirely, of course, but largely based on the work that I did with him and a, a few of the other. We were among the first people who were really applying these projective geometry techniques of you know, what is a very mathematical field to a field that had been just not really properly mathematicized in a sense, uh, of course, to the extent that we developed this uh, mathematical uh, theory of the whole thing. And that that was, I suppose, the, the most important achievement there. And I suppose, and bringing it into a, a situation where it is now really part of the mainstream of computer vision and everyone um, really working in the field should should know it. And, uh, well, thank you, Richard. We're running out of time now. And I'd just like to thank you again and uh, congratulate you on your award. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm very grateful for the uh, recognition of the Academy. And now we'll go to Professor Helene Marsh to introduce our next awardee. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today celebrating Academy awardees. In particular, I join you today to celebrate the Thomas Rankin Lyle Medal for 2023. The Thomas Rankin Lyle Medal is a career award that co commemorates the contributions of Sir Thomas Rankin Lyle to Australian science and industry generally and in particular to his own fields of physics and mathematics. The purpose of the medal is to recognise outstanding achievement by a scientist in Australia for research in mathematics or physics. And in 2023, this medal was jointly awarded to Professor Susan Scott and Professor Nick Wormald. We're now going to hear from Professor Nick Wormald but before we do, I'm going to read his official citation. Technological, biological, social and logistical networks are ubiquitous features of modern life. Professor Nick Warmold is a world leader in the field of random graph theory, which combines advanced probability theory, combinatorics and theoretical computer science to produce deep insights into the nature of large and complex networks. The mathematics that he produces leads to greater understanding of the structure of real world networks and for new methods of modeling them. This in turn leads to versatile tools of widespread use in algorithmic computer science and network optimization with other applications in physics, coding theory for communications, underground mine design and genetics. Nick is responsible for an impressive number of major breakthroughs in these areas and several standard methods used today were his invention. Now let's hear from Nick. Oh, thanks for the introduction and thanks very much to the Academy for making this award. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the research that went into it. Uh, it's on random structures. So you've all seen random networks, um, say networks of people and networks of computers. In uh, mathematics, we often call these graphs and we focus not on the nature of the, um, the pieces of the network, but just on whether they are vertices, which are, which are these um, 
the nodes in the network and whether there is an edge between any two given vertices. So the edge is, is drawn by a line. <clears throat> now, um, we have questions uh, on the structure of such graphs. Um, one thing I started looking at, even in my PhD, and I'm going to talk about how it carried on through to very recently. So one question uh, involves the degrees of vertices. The degree of a vertex is the number of links or edges that come into it. <clears throat> and uh, we can ask for a question of how many graphs have given degrees. So how many structures are there where the degrees of the vertices are, are given, the given numbers. In the case that the, the degrees are all the same, we call it a regular graph. And uh, it would be a deregular graph if all the vertices have degree D. In my PhD, I found some enumeration formulae for these sorts of things. And I'll just describe how we might go about doing that. So for instance, for three regular graphs where every vertex is to have degree three, what we do is we put out a lot of bins and we put say three dots in each bin and then take a, a pairing up of all the dots. We can calculate how many ways we can pair them up very easily. Now, once we've done this, if we let each bin become a vertex, then we have a graph. Uh, and the number of ways of pairing them up um, corresponds to the number of graphs um, in a many to one fashion. So we can calculate the number of graphs this way. But there is a wrinkle, and that is that we don't, in a graph, we don't want two uh, of the edges joining the same two vertices. And that means that some of these pairings are excluded. And so um, we have to estimate how many exclusions there are, and that leads to approximate answers. The answers we get are better and better as the number of vertices goes to infinity. Uh, but for this sort of work, we do need the degrees to be quite small in order for the approximations to work. Okay, well, you might notice that when we did this, uh, if you take a random pairing, then you kind of get a random graph. And you can make sure that every graph occurs with exactly the same probability this way. So we have a way of generating graphs uniformly at random. Now, all that is uh, a couple of uh, results in what I thought of as pure mathematics. <clears throat> that was until about 1984, when um, I had a party and one of the invitees was uh, a friend of mine from a local neighborhood parenting group. And he happened to be a biologist and he asked this question about um, that he was looking at these um, patterns of colonization <clears throat> of birds on islands. Uh, you can look at some birds and you can create a graph by drawing an edge between a bird and an island if the bird is present on that island. And then you could ask, is this colonization pattern unusual or is it sort of random? Maybe there's some competition going on or some interaction. Uh, now, if you compare to a sort of random colonization pattern, then certain things will look un unusual when they shouldn't be really. For instance, the bird like the dodo, uh, is extinct, so it doesn't occur anywhere. So the fact that it, there's a bird with, not on any island might be uh, not an unusual event, even though random configurations um, don't have such things. Similarly, a traffic island, uh, an island that's too small to hold birds, um, will be unusual. But these shouldn't be th this, so this shouldn't be thought of a, as an unusual colonization pattern. To, to factor in these effects, what we do is we calculate the degree of every vertex in our data. And then instead of generating some random um, set of edges, what we do is we generate a random graph with the same degrees as the given one. So we need to select at random from all graphs with those degrees and then compare that with the data we were given. Now, how do we select at random from graphs with the given degrees? Well, we know how to do that, as long as the degrees are not too big. And the methods I had at the time were good enough to answer the particular question that my friend was asking. Um, so um, that's this limitation on the degrees was a bit of a problem. But an improvement occurred a few years later. Um, if we want to generate uh, we were aiming to generate graphs with higher degrees and these multiple edges, these in, the, in those random pairings, the case where two 
edges join the same two vertices. That was the problem. And instead of just throwing the result away and trying again, what I tried with Brendan McKay was to use some switching operations where you take one of those double edges and you take a couple of other edges as well, shown in green here, and you rearrange them so that um, you get another pairing. And using this operation, analyzing it and using it carefully, we were able to generate random graphs with much higher degrees and with given degrees, but much larger than before. Now, this also gave new results for enumeration. So we were able to generate graphs with degrees up to n to the power of one third, whereas before they used to be only constant size degrees. And we were able to enumerate the graphs asymptotically as long as the degrees were at most the square root of n. Now, McKay and I also found another way to enumerate that worked for very large degrees when the degrees were around a constant times n. And the formulae we were getting in both cases were the same. But note that there's a big gap here between square root of n and constant times n. So we had this conjecture that in that gap, the same formula as before would hold. That was in 1990. And there was no real progress on this, although a few groups around the world were looking at it at various times, until uh, a few years ago, <clears throat> I started looking at another approach with Anita Liebenau. And this approach, well, here's an example to give you an idea of the, the different aspect of this approach. Suppose you have a whole uh, herd of sheep and, there are, and you know there are 100 sheep, uh, but suppose they wander off into different mobs and maybe they're in different valleys and you can only compare two mobs at a time. And you might be able to see easily that um, the first mob is twice as large as the second mob without doing any exact counting, just a quick estimate. And the second mob is about the same size as the third mob. Well, if you have that information and knowing the total number is 100, then you can work out roughly how many are in each mob. So we did this not with mobs of sheep, of course, but instead of a mob, what we looked at is all the graphs with a given degree sequence. We compared that to all the graphs with a very similar degree sequence and estimated the ratio. And you do that with basically all the degree sequences. And since you know in total how many graphs there are, then you can compute how many there are with a given degree sequence. And this answered the question and gave good, what we call asymptotic formulae for the numbers of graphs of given degrees in, in the whole gap range. Um, so those things I've been talking about are like a story of two intertwined problems, enumeration and generation. And there are more relations between these two things than I've had time to describe. Uh, but besides that, we can use the enumeration formula to study what structures are very likely to occur inside random structures or random objects. There's, there's an example I'll give here with what's called a random hypergraph. So in this case, a hypergraph has um, a set of, in this case, random triangles drawn on vertices. And it involves the core of the random hypergraph. You can get the core by deleting any triangle where there's a vertex containing uh, incident with only that triangle. So there's a vertex there incident with one triangle. And now there are two more vertices with only one triangle each. So you delete those triangles and keep deleting triangles like that and you'll end up with the core where every vertex is in at least two triangles. Now what's interesting about the core is about 30 years ago, um, uh, a new way of creating what are called minimal perfect hash functions, which are useful in computer science. It was a very good performing algorithm, but it relies on a random hypergraph and you wanted to know if the random hypergraph was likely to have a core. We didn't want one. Uh, and using the enumeration formula, we found how many edges you should use to generate the random hypergraph to be quite sure that it has no core. There are several other examples of this sort of thing, use of enumeration formula, but of course I haven't got time to go into those. Thanks for your attention. Now it's my pleasure to welcome live with us today, Professor Nick Warmeld. 
So thank you for joining us today, Nick, and congratulations on the Thomas Rankin Lyle Medal. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So my, I understand you've been working in this area since your PhD. So what drew you to it? Why were you so fascinated with graph re Oh, what drew me to it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the uh, originally, I guess, even, even when I was a, a university student, the um, the uh, uh, I was interested in combinatorics, you know, uh, collections of objects and their discrete structures. And I was always wondering whether or well, how much uh, other branches of mathematics can be used to analyze these things. And I started my PhD in looking at enumeration, which is counting counting these objects, um, uh, for instance, graphs. And I found that if you wanted to find the number of graphs of a certain sort, sometimes maybe there's a formula, but it looks like it's going to be very complicated. And, and for some of these problems, no one's got an exact formula for the numbers. Then it turned out that if you take, if you want approximate formulae, for the numbers of structures like these graphs when there's a large number of vertices, then you get much nicer formulae. And it turned out that if you look at random objects and take random graphs, that gives you a way to find these formulae in a very neat way often using some probability theory and related things. So that got me into the random structures. And could you elaborate a bit more on what is meant by renumeration? Please. Oh, enumeration, enumeration, yeah. Well, um, enumeration actually it has a couple of meanings in, in mathematics and in English, I think. So when you say uh, enumerate something, you might mean you make a list of them all, all the possibilities. But when I, or it also means just basically to count. And when I use it, I mean I'm just counting, in other words, finding a formula for the number of these structures. Okay, thank you. So um, at the start of your talk, you spoke about how random structures in a regular graph have all the same degrees, whereas in a deregular one, they're all different. So with a real world example, why is it important to know if your graph or network is regular or deregular? Oh, okay. So the, the non-regular non ones have arbitrary degrees. Now in a real world situation, uh, there are a few real-world real world situations where regular graphs occur naturally. But the main reason that I talk about regular graphs is that if you make all the degrees the same, then the properties are often a lot nicer. And there may be formulae you can get that are nicer in that case. Although in the question I was talking about with enumeration, the formula can be generalized to the non-regular case. And the first approaches we made on this problem, though, it was much easier to deal with the regular case first. It just is, so it's basically a simplification that makes the analysis easier for some in some cases. Thank you. So uh, you mentioned your friend with that bird example and colonization. Could you tell us uh, what, how you were able to help your friend with the, the bird colonization problem? How it helped? Yeah. So the that was kind of interesting because there were. Um, at the time, there were papers in the literature kind of arguing about how uh, how to generate the random structures, and they were doing things similar to the data that my friend had. They would analyse it and say, generate some random networks and say, hey, all our random networks, um, they don't have the features of this colonisation pattern. Uh, but it turned out that was often due to the fact that they weren't generating networks uniformly at random. It's a bit like using some ad hoc method to do something and trying to deduce something about it. Um, and uh, when with my friend's example, I generated lots of random networks and the features that I looked at for his example, I was able to say these features are fairly commonly occurring in the random networks. So there's no evidence actually of any special interaction, no strong evidence of special interaction between the, the uh, colonizations. Okay, so you also um, talked about having to factor in factors like the um, dodo being instinct and the traffic island being too small to hold birds. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have to put in other variables, for example, predators or existing to, with that, such problems? Well, predators, well, something like that. Uh, this is in this is um, 
part of the point of fixing the vertex degrees is you know what the vertex degrees are in your example, and you there are many things you don't know. But one thing you do know is the vertex degrees. So by fixing the vertex degrees and generating random structures uh, of the, you know, the same vertex degrees, we can try to say that the, this uh, pattern looks natural or very unusual. And so you, you don't know anything about predators or you assume you don't know. But if, for instance, uh, your random networks look very different from the, uh, the data that was given, then a predator might be an explanation for that. For instance, if, uh, if there was a fox that liked to eat yellow birds, then the islands with the fox on them, and suppose there are two species of yellow birds, the island with the foxes on them, would have no yellow birds, and the ones without the foxes would have both species, perhaps. And, you know, the co-occurrence there would be something that would be detected, perhaps, by the experiments. Okay, okay. So you spoke about how you could factor in unusual effects and how you generated a random graph with the same degree as the given one. So then you select at random from the graph with the same given degrees. So could you explain how you would run this problem so that you would be able to explain how this works yeah how, how it works oh so assuming you know how to generate something at random so actually maybe so maybe it's best to think that you don't suppose you want to sample a random network with the same degrees as the data you can you could start by drawing out a picture of every random network with every network that has the same degrees as the data okay now, if you did that, well, a lot of these problems have so many different possible networks that there's more than the number of atoms in the universe, right? So it's completely impractical to, to draw them all out. But if you did, then you just select one at random with equal probability with each one, okay? And then you and then you do that many times, and you look at some dark, some specific uh, aspect of the networks you're getting. Like you might look at in how many networks are the, are the two yellow birds occurring on the same island and how many do they actually not, how many times do they uh, have islands that they don't occur on? And you just keep that as some of your data uh, and keep track of it. And then at the end, you see if your results there look very different from the um, that specific uh, feature of the data that you were given. And if you find features like that that are extremely unusual, then you, you say that something uh, something strange is happening here. It's not a random network. Okay. Thank you again. So just for a final question, I'd just like to ask you, what has been your favourite problem that you've solved using this methodology? Um, yeah, well, so um, the, using the methodology is a little bit... Um, the using random networks uh basically i study the random networks themselves and don't tend to use them for something okay <laughs> so, so I, prove, I prove things about them and then uh and then sometimes those things have happened to have uses so i guess so one of the one of the uses of well one thing one thing that i worked on one thing i'm quite proud of is uh, my development of these use of different equations to study the evolution of random networks, if you like, and uh, or the evolution of processes on these random networks. And this is the thing, this is, uh, this is actually something I used to analyze that thing I mentioned in the talk about the core of a random network. So this was useful for those hash functions, but it's also been useful for things like, you know, mobile phones, um, they have to communicate when they communicate. They send messages, and some of the bits get lost. And so there are a lot of different ways of you know uh, encoding messages, such that if bits are lost, you can recover those bits. Uh, and some of the well, the uh, theoretically some of the theoretically optimal ways to do that uh, actually were using random networks, just like the bird networks. Actually, there's two. There's a uh, there's the birds in the islands, and you stack a few of these random networks together with the right degrees, and you can use that network to encode your messages and actually um, actually give some um, you know highly efficient codes that way. So that was a very nice thing that occurred, you know, after my work. That um, but it, but the differential equation method did play some role in that. 
Oh, that's great to hear. So thank you. It's a fascinating area and it's kept you going since your PhD and I'm sure you're going to still keep working on it. So congratulations once again, Nick. Oh, thanks very much. I'm very thankful to the Academy and all my supporters like, um, you know, uh, family and colleagues and co-authors all play a role. And it's all, we're all in a big network together, you know. Uh, okay. But, but uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. for It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So now we're going to go to our uh, Secretary or Vice President of the Academy, Professor Malcolm Sambridge, to introduce our next awardee. Should have said Secretary. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today celebrating Academy awardees. In particular, I join you today to celebrate the Mawson Medal for 2022. The Mawson Medal recognises outstanding contributions to earth science in Australia and commemorates the work of the late Sir Douglas Mawson, geologist and Antarctic explorer. The award is made to a scientist normally resident in Australia and whose work has relevance to Australia. In 2022, this medal was awarded to Professor Andrew Roberts. Before we hear Andrew, I will read his official citation. Professor Andrew Roberts has made fundamentally important contributions to understanding the magnetization of sediments, which provides the basis for use of paleomagnetism to reconstruct global plate tectonic movements and to understand variations in the Earth's magnetic field through its history. His work influences all aspects of understanding sedimentary magnetization acquisition and has particularly contributed to recognising that the previously poorly known magnetic mineral greigite and magnetic minerals produced by magnetotactic bacteria make important contributions to the magnetisation of globally distributed sedimentary rocks. He is an international leader in the field of environmental magnetic analysis of climate change and has developed new methods in rock magnetism that are used widely in solid state physics, material science, the magnetic recording industry, and earth science. His work in environmental magnetism has made significant contributions to understanding African monsoon dynamics, sea level variations, and Arctic and Antarctic glacial history. Now let's hear from Andrew. Well, hello everybody, thanks for coming. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's a real honor to be given the Mawson Medal and it's just a delight, so so thanks very much. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, my, my work to date uh, so far. And, and in my career, you might think it's a little bit of a misspent life looking at the magnetism of mud, um, but I'm gonna try and explain to you why, why that's so interesting and important. So firstly, you might ask, why do we study sediments? Well, if we look at, at uh, an introductory geology slide, you'll see a, a picture of the rock cycle where we have igneous and metamorphic rocks being eroded, transported and deposited into say a, a lake or, or an ocean. And I study sediments. These sediments are the eroded remnants of older rocks or sometimes they're chemical precipitates. They're only 5% of Earth's crust, but 75% of rocks exposed at the surface. And why study them? Well, we wouldn't have a fossil record without sediments. Uh, we wouldn't know about big events on, on, on Earth uh, in the detail that we do, like impacts, uh, extraterrestrial impacts, or, or major climate changes without the fossil, without the, the sedimentary record. So uh, there's a huge range of processes that can be studied by looking at sediments. I do paleomagnetism. Paleo means ancient, and magnetism is magnetism. This is uh, our planetary magnetic field of, of, of Earth. It shields us from radiation from the sun and from the cosmos. And it's argued that life would not be possible without the shielding effect of Earth's magnetic field. Paleomagnetism has been used extensively to, to study, to, to establish the paradigm of plate tectonics, which is the, the massive paradigm of the Earth sciences. So the present day plate configuration looks like this, but 200 million years ago, if we measured the magnetism of all these continental blocks, we, we could reconstruct it to look something like that. This is all now well established, but you know the early Earth is, is the frontier now of trying to reconstruct what the tectonics were like back then. 
we have these uh, uh, mid-ocean ridges which fr from which crust separates, so the continents are spreading apart along these mid-ocean ridges, and the record of Earth's magnetic field is recorded in the ocean crust to give what we call the polarity time scale. So half the time your compass would point north, and half the time in Earth history your compass would point south. So these normal polarity periods like we're in now are, are black on this, on this chart, and reverse polarity with your compass pointing south is in white. And so we can use all of this information to reconstruct the tectonics of the earth, to, to date rocks, and to do all sorts of things. So paleomagnetism is an incredibly uh, valuable discipline for, for lots of things. If you look at a map of the earth, two thirds of it's covered in water. So that means sediments are being deposited underneath and sediments are being deposited on the continents as well. So if you want to understand paleomagnetism, working with sediments, is a really effective way of doing that. So I've spent my life working uh, with, with the magnetism of sediments or mud. So when I was growing up, the textbook view of, of how uh, sediments get their magnetism is that magnetic particles settle through the seafloor, uh, settle through the, the water column or, or lake column, settle on the seafloor, and on average, uh, the Earth's magnetic field aligns these magnetic particles uh, to give what's called a depositional remnant magnetization, which records the magnetic field incredibly faithfully. Uh, this is probably a 1970s to 80s view. Um, we now know that this situation only holds for a tiny fraction of rocks and a huge amount of the work that we've been doing through, through the course of my career and, and many others has been to refine this view. Um, one example, because time is short, is that we've, we've established the importance of these organisms called magnetotactic bacteria. So these are organisms that have uh, chains of magnetic particles inside them. And so this is started in the wrong point, but uh, this is the field here and the bacteria are swimming. If it goes around in circles, here we go. Uh, the bacteria are at the edge of a water drop. We flip the field so that it's going the other way. The bacteria follow the field and then they'll go back again or round in circles. As the, as, the, as the field is circulated. So the point of all of this is that these bacteria, when they die, leave incredibly good records of the magnetic field uh, uh, along with these detrital particles. And we've learned a huge amount about how these sediments are mixed and how the magnetization is acquired. Uh, that really updates this, this long-term view that places the field of paleomagnetism and all the things that you can do with it on a, on a much more secure foundation. Then what happens when mud is buried? Well. Um, uh, this is a, a series of chemical reactions that happens when sediment is deposited, other things are deposited along with it, like organic matter. And so that organic matter gets degraded by microbes in the sediment, and they use oxygen first to, to, to degrade the organic matter. That's called aerobic respiration. But there are other compounds, once the oxygen is gone, from which other types of bacteria can uh, 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 take oxygen in order to, to, to feed their metabolism. And so nitrate, oxygen is stripped out of nitrate called nitrate reduction. And then from manganese oxides, manganese reduction, iron oxides, iron reduction, sulfate is abundant in seawater and, and et cetera. And then the organic matter ferment, ferments and, and methane is formed. So this is a sequence of reactions that happens in sedimentary environments. You might only get to, to a few of these steps uh, and in, in some environments that are rich in organic carbon, you'll go all, all, all the way through. So that's why depth is arbitrary here. Uh, you might get sulfitic in the water column, like the modern Black Sea, which, which has no oxygen in it, in it at, at depth. Okay, so that's what happens when mud gets buried. But in terms of the magnetization, what happens is that the, the, the iron oxides that we rely on at the surface get dissolved at these sorts of depths which destroys the paleomagnetic record and other minerals can form. And, and so what we found is these magnetic bacteria that, that I talked about a minute ago, they can form, uh, these bacteria can live in these sorts of environments, usually near the sediment water interface. Um, and, and we've discovered their importance over these years. Uh, and then there's a whole range of other magnetic minerals that we've discovered that can form within the sediment and really uh, on the one hand, disrupt your paleomagnetic signal, but on the other hand, give you really interesting information about the environments uh, of those sediments. Um, and so it's a, it's a two-edged sword. But we've worked 
a, a lot of my career, I've, I've done some some a lot of work on grigite, this mineral here. Um, um, and these are sulfitic and methanic environments. And so these are iron sulfides that are forming in these settings where dissolved iron reacts with sulfide to form iron sulfides. And we have pyrotite and smithite forming as well. And most recently, I've done a lot of work on grigite and these guys are, are more recent. We're, we're really unpacking the range of processes that can, can affect the magnetism of sediments. And then deeper in the methanic zone, uh, we're finding when there's no sulfide left, magnetite can form again through another series of, of bacterial reactions. So uh, really we're enriching what we know about sedimentary magnetization uh, every year, even now, after all of these years. Um, so on the one hand, we study these fundamental processes for how sediments get magnetized. And on the other hand, we use that information to study the environments to understand what's going on. So environmental magnetism is, is something I do. Uh, and, and this is an example of the Sahara. It's, it's an amazing photo of a dust storm ripping across the Sahara. And you can see the reddish color of this, this dust cloud is because of the, the, the pigment hematite, um, an iron oxide, which is magnetic, which we can detect. And if we go to sea in ships and take sediment cores from the ocean floor, we can get records of this red mineral hematite where it goes through minima and maxima, minima, maxima, like so, and then higher frequency signal superimposed. Uh, in order to understand uh, the signals that drive, uh, the climatic signals that drive these hematite inputs from, from windblown dust from the Sahara, what we can do is, is uh, do bandpass filtering. And so we take, uh, these are uh, uh, astronomically calculated uh, orbital solutions at different frequencies. So we have long eccentricity here. And if we bandpass filter the hematite signal at the same frequency range, we see that, that this signal is coming out quite clearly and that it maps to orbital long eccentricity very well. And if we do that bandpass filtering for each of these short eccentricity obliquity precession, we see a, a remarkable likeness. And that's because the dust is being controlled by the monsoon, which has been controlled by uh, the, the, the amount of uh, sunlight, uh, solar radiation hitting the Earth, which is controlled by Earth's orbit. And so we get these amazing records of, of hematite, for example, which help to, to tell us about how the monsoon has functioned, the African monsoon in this case, over long periods of time. And what that has done is that there have been periods when when the dust is high, when the de when the Sahara was a hyper-arid desert, very little rainfall. And other times when uh, the monsoon front was able to penetrate northward, we get greening of the Sahara, vegetation in the Sahara, and that damps dust production down. And so we go through these cycles, often on 20,000 year periods of, of alternating between hyper-arid and, and green Sahara episodes. This has a huge influence on, on migration of hominids out of, out of and into and out of Africa, uh, large mammals as well. So, so understanding the environmental backdrop for evolution has been uh, an important part of, of, of this type of work that we've been doing using the magnetism of sediment. Um, and for me, uh, being awarded the Mawson Medal is a, a really lovely honor, having worked in Antarctica doing environmental magnetism to study Antarctic ice sheet history. Uh, again, drilling into from sea ice platform into McMurdo Sound and seeing all sorts of amazing things, including landscape. Um, and of course, honors like this are lovely, but you don't do them in isolation. Science, for me anyway, has been a team sport, and I've been lucky to have an incredible cast of of supporting players uh, working in our team over many years. Very grateful to them. And, and of course, to my family for, for their involvement. Um, so now we're gonna flip over to, to uh, Q and A. Um, and I don't know how my internet will work. I'm out of town, uh, indulging my love for motorcycle touring and bird watching uh, in far North Queensland. So I hope the question and answer works. Thanks very much. It's my pleasure to welcome with us today, live, Professor Andrew Roberts. So Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us north of the Tropic of Capricorn and uh, congratulations once again. So um, on the um, Mawson Medal. 
So Thank I'm going to much. start off with some questions. So, and my first question would be, would our life be different today if the polarity was reversed? If the field was in a stable reverse polarity position, I would say not at all. Um, the field does two things. It goes, uh, it points north and it points south. If the field was in a transitional phase between south and north, life would be a lot more complicated. You know, the early mariners who depended on Earth's magnetic field for navigation <laughs> wouldn't have had a reliable uh, source for pointing north. So they would have had to use the stars, which they did. Um, so, so the magnetic field, uh, then as now has has been a really useful pointer, but not the only pointer. And when do we expect the uh, the polarity change again? We have no idea. Is the simple okay. answer. Um, if you if you analyze the time series going back as long as we have it, the process is entirely stochastic as far as we know, um, and so predicting the next is difficult. Um, uh, Gauss, the polymath in the 1830s, first set up geomagnetic observatories in Europe. Um, and since the time of Gauss, the field has decayed by, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it's about 10%. So if you think almost two centuries, 10%, people have speculated, are we going into a re reversal now? Um, but one of the things that's happened over the course of my career is we have much more detailed records of the ups and downs of the field, and they're up and down all the time, really random. Um, and you could be dropping into a, 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 a phase when the field tried to reverse polarity, or it might recover. We, we just don't know. And what tools do you use to measure the magnetism of con continental blocks? So we have uh, human measured records going back from observatories to the time of Gauss, so almost 200 years. That's not very long when you think about the Earth being 4.6 billion years old. Um, uh, then we have records from mariners that go back about 400 years, mainly Northern Hemisphere, awful Southern Hemisphere coverage. Um, so beyond that, you're depending on, on rocks to record the magnetic field of, of the Earth. So uh, igneous rocks, volcanoes produce lava flows that record the magnetic field really well, but they're spotty. The, the eruption frequency is very low. So sediments give us a continuous record. Lots of complications with mixing of the sediment by by biota that that um, um, smooth the record out, um, but but basically for anything beyond four hundred years to four point six billion, we rely on the rock record, which is which is what we study. So for me, uh, a big emphasis of of sediments understanding how they record the information is it biased, uh, how is it biased? All these things become important for trying to understand the fidelity of that recording of the magnetic field. So um, yeah, on the continents and in the oceans, that's that's what we do. We, we, we go and measure uh, the magnetism of, of rocks. Okay. And uh, what is griite? I think you said it had iron sulfide in it. Yeah. And could you tell us some of the work you've done with it? Yeah, so, so griite is Fe3S4. So magnetite, which was lodestone, which is what a lot of people would know it as, you know, the earliest magnetic material um, known to humans, um, is Fe3O4. So it's an iron oxide, and, and griggite is the equivalent iron sulfide. And, and like magnetite, it's incredibly strongly mag magnetic. Um, famous work from Yale, um, Bob Berner, um, in the in the 60s and early 70s said griggite's metastable um, so we don't expect it to be preserved in the geological record we've proven that to be wrong because we find it in a lot of rocks an awful lot of rocks um, and over the last three or four years we've discovered thermodynamically why that's true um, through some really lovely chemical work done by by colleagues in the us and the uk um, and and now we know it's not metastable um, which which simply validates the work we've been doing for 30 years now. Um, so, so yeah, griggite is a, a really important iron sulfide mineral that occurs in reducing environments, which covers a lot of, a lot of territory on earth. So, um, you know, and it wasn't even in the textbooks 30 years ago. So um, basically we've put it on the map, showed that it's really important and, and, and showing when does it record reliable information and unre unreliable information. And it does both. And I understand you just said it's pretty uh, abundant. It's easy to find or not? Um, 
you have to go to the right environments, um, but those environments are very common. So, you know, you walk around in a swamp and you smell the rotten egg smell coming out, that's hydrogen sulfide and and that's a sulfitic environment. So um, in, in organic rich uh, continental uh, margin environments, extremely common. And why do sedimentary rocks, or, uh, ask, why are they so good at preserving fossils? Well, to preserve fossils, you have to have a, a few things go right. You have to have fairly rapid burial and and burial under the right conditions that preserve whatever bone or soft tissue material you're, you're hoping to see. Um, and so when there's no oxygen, that's a good environment. So that, that's also the, the condition when uh, minerals like grigite and these other things that we've been studying um, form. So... Um, it's a bit more tricky for these magnetic bacteria that we that we are interested in because because they dissolve if they produce magnetite they dissolve in those environments so there's a fine balance between you know what conditions give rise to preservation and and what conditions don't and why do those bacteria have uh, magnetic particles in them it's <laughs> a really good question um so um Recent molecular clock work on these bacteria indicates that the genes that that enable this this movement along the magnetic field called magnetotaxis, it's an ability to sense the magnetic field and swim along it uh, for the bacteria. And the genes that enable magnetotaxis go back from molecular clock evidence to about 3.2 billion years ago. The oceans then were chemically quite unpleasant. And so to survive those conditions, you'd need to be able to to navigate into the right part of the redox environment to, to survive. That's one argument. The other argument that we've done a lot of work on in recent years is actually they're involved in the shuttling, uh, the oxidation and reduction of chemical species across those chemical interfaces. And they're actually involved in the cleaning up of those environments um, but by that, that chemical shuttling rather than just choosing that to, to, to live there. So um, why do they do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> why did the chicken cross the road kinds of questions um, um, but the fact that they do it is amazing and the fact that they biomineralize within their cells these perfect crystals that in that are not too large to be magnetically non-uniform but just right that enable them to do this magnetic shuttling is simply incredible and and i didn't show any images of the, the perfect crystallinity the perfect stoichiometry of these of these beautiful little crystals but but they're stunning and these bacteria produce them exactly right it's it's the goldilocks um it's the goldilocks um, yeah. mineral shape and type um for, for following a magnetic field and i understand birds also have some magnetic yeah the birds do it, the bees do it, yeah, uh, yeah. do it termites sea turtles mm -hmm. salmon um okay so there's a difference between uh, what we have really strong evidence for and, and, and what we have inference for in terms of the animal kingdom and, and biomagnetism. And, and the work we're doing with these bacteria builds on, on the shoulders of giants. Joe Kirschwink at Caltech was really the, the founder of the field of biomagnetism, and, and he's, he's working on human brain magnetism at the moment. Um, but there's a, all, all sorts of organisms, um, and, and birds are probably... Okay, there's magnetite in the beak of pigeons, for example, that's argued to help them with, with, with directional sensing, but they're also quite capable of producing a visual map of where they're going. So it's not just one sense, it's multiple senses being used as far as we know. So um, re really fascinating um, and, and yeah, fascinating. Yeah, I agree. And I'm gonna ask you now about the hyperarid cycle in the Sahara. Um, does that relate to Homo sapiens leaving Africa to go to Europe and Asia? So, you know, one, it's one of the, so the environmental hypothesis for, for providing an environment where, where Homo sapiens could evolve and then migrate out of Africa is, is, is what that work supports. And, and if you have this huge hyperarid desert, it's a little bit difficult to, to imagine traversing it. 
Um, but the evidence of these Green Sahara um, episodes from, from dust, from pollen, from leaf wax evidence, from, from numerical climate modeling, all indicates that there was a waxing and waning of the Sahara. And there were times when it, it, it was really uh, a savanna type grassland and in the in the wadis and in the river valleys, there would have been uh, lovely um, environments where where you could happily have lived and, and migrated. And and in the most recent Green Sahara episodes, there's evidence of of life, but it's very difficult to date in those sorts of environments. Whereas marine sediments are much easier to date. So if we get a record of the dust variations, it's, we can we can produce a fairly compelling record of what climate was doing. Um, so it. It's an idea, the environmental hypothesis for, for, for providing an environment that enabled hominins to, to leave Africa. Um, and, and it seems to have some currency, yeah. Okay, so a couple of quick questions because we're running out of time. So uh, could you briefly explain bandpass filtering, please? So basically, if you have a signal with a lot of w wiggles and you want to know what the dominant frequencies are, you, you, you restrict the wavelengths over which you can you can uh, uh, see the wiggles, and so um, what we see from our dust record is that this four hundred thousand year variation of Earth's orbit matches the four hundred thousand year record in, of our dust record periodicity in our dust record very well. Then the short eccentricity one hundred five thousand years maps very well. Then obliquity forty one thousand, precession twenty two thousand. So these are all the the periods at which Earth's orbit vary around the sun varies and 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 the amount of radiation from the sun varies at those periodicities so um, what we're seeing is a direct measure of solar radiation driving the monsoons which drives these green sahara episodes um, and and by inference provides a more suitable environments for for hominins to live in that part of north africa Thanks again. And the final question, how long do you think the Earth's magnetic field will last? Mm. A long time. <laughs> a, a long time. Um, <laughs> that's another one that people speculate about. But but there's incredibly heated debate at the moment about when it started. And, and there's evidence that it's older than 3.5 billion, let's say. Uh, when you say the Earth start it was 4.6 billion years old. Um, people are trying to push it back to, to 4 billion or so. Um, how long will it go? Well, over time, the planet will cool and the field is generated within the Earth's outer core, which is liquid, thousands of kilometers under our feet. And when, that, when the planet cools and the outer core solidifies, we'll have no magnetic field. So that's been the case on Mars and other planets. Uh, and, and at some stage, that will be our future. Um, too far into the future to, to think about for humanity, I think. Yes, we have more pressing problems to think about right now. But that was a great talk and I, I like how you answered the questions as well. So thank, thank you. you very much and congratulations, Andrew. Thanks to the Academy, it's a great honour. And of course, for, for my team of more than 70 uh, people who've come through our group over the years, I'm really grateful to them too and, and to family. That now brings us to the end of our event this afternoon. I would like to thank everyone across Australia and the world who has joined us to celebrate Australian science and the work of our extraordinary awardees. This event and our event last week to celebrate career honorific awardees are both available as recordings on the Academy website. We invite you to visit and watch. Thank you for joining us to celebrate excellence in Australian science. I'm Frances Saparovic. Good afternoon. <laughs>